I was at a point where I was just so tired of sitting in front of a computer and composing. There was something that I needed to do physically. I wasn't actually producing music with my body. The thing I lo always loved about New York is the energy. There's just this vortex you're kind of pulled into it, for better or for worse, because sometimes it can be overwhelming. It's definitely been a motivating force in my writing. If you want to be famous, it's a very different approach than wanting to create things that people will enjoy. And there's something magical like that you can create something uh, you know, in your bedroom and the whole world can enjoy it. I think that's a beautiful thing. If the tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? That really stuck with me because if no one's there to hear it, then it doesn't really exist. But even back then when you were learning the basics, I mean, you might look back at one of those earlier things and say, you know, I was pretty good, but I was yeah. just really green behind the ears or whatever and, and I dismiss something that was actually pretty good. He's a Brooklyn-based singer-songwriter who started off doing film scoring and is now venturing into instrumental soundscapes with his upcoming album, One Ambient Corridors. Please welcome Jason Vitelli to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm good. Awesome I'm good. to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on, telling us about your upcoming album, your career, everything. Yeah, it's been quite a whirlwind since I uh, kind of made my decision to create music. Uh, and uh, I think it, at this point, it's been probably a little over 20 years. 22 years that I've been, you know, actively doing uh, music and uh, it's been quite a ride. So 22 years ago, or maybe earlier than that, just whatever, what was your first experience with music like, or what made you want to pursue a career in music? Well, I guess it, I, I did take piano lessons when I was uh, seven years old. And so, you know, I took lessons throughout the time I was a kid, uh, stopped around high school. Uh, took up the guitar in high school and kind of just played in a few cover bands. Um, and, you know, I went to school for, you know, uh, Binghamton University, upstate New York. And, uh, you know, I think I consider that the beginning of my journey into really becoming a musician and a writer. Uh, I started off like pre-med, like a lot of folks do who are smart. And I ended up with a music performance degree. <laughs> so I kind of came out of school um, challenged by what, what the hell am I gonna, what am I going to do with this? Because I didn't want to teach. I wanted to pursue something. Like I wanted to take a journey with it, see where I could go with it. And so I went to NYU uh, for film scoring. And that's really when I started developing music for, for video and getting my chops down um, through that experience and subsequent internships, I, I met uh, a great uh, film composer. Uh, he worked on History Channel for many years, uh, Gary Posner. Um, and I apprenticed under him for a little under two years. And I think that that was a life-changing experience for me, is apprenticing under somebody who's making a living at it. Um, yeah. Not that it's a prerequisite, like you, you don't have to make a living at it. You can do it however yeah, it makes sense. But he had a rigor, rigor in his process that I wasn't taught in school. And, and that's what it really came home to me, uh, that a working musician, a working composer, you're going to learn more from them. And so yeah. that was really sort of the beginnings that I consider. So that was about yeah. 22 years ago. And, and so Brooklyn, Binghamton, NYU, are you just like an all around New Yorker? Or like, have yeah, you yeah. been I'm, here your I'm whole actually life? actually from Long Island. I'm uh, in Suffolk County, kind of like right smack in the center in Huntington Village. Uh, so yeah. I, I've lived around here for most of my life. For sure, yeah. Are you a music artist trying to find a way to get your music on as many streaming platforms as possible? Then check out DistroKid. DistroKid is a super user-friendly and super easy-to-use service that will make your music available in stores like Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, Amazon Music, YouTube, Snapchat, everything. Everything you could imagine, it's available. People will even be able to add your songs into their Instagram stories. 
DistroKid helps you with the distribution, monetization, and promotion of all of your music. Use the link in the description of this video for 7% off any DistroKid package you want. Pick from musician packages designed to help artists get their own music out there, or even get a label package where you can manage up to 100 artists from one profile. So that's more for like managers, labels, and you can also get the musician package that I mentioned earlier, which is more for artists, producers, things like that. And it's super easy, and you can get 7% off any package right now with the link in the description of this video. So once again, if you're looking for a way to get your music on as many streaming platforms as possible, I'm talking any platform you can think of, get DistroKid and get 7% off right now with the link in the description back to the program you have singer songwriting credits but like you mentioned you started out with film scoring what was that time like and how did you transition from that into original music yeah that, that was a very interesting point um i was doing it for a number of years as a side job uh you're just getting here and there uh work from you know independent filmmakers um, and it was about maybe around 2005. So I, I was doing it for like three or four years. And I, I was at a point where I was just so tired of sitting in front of a computer and composing. Uh, and it, it was something that I needed to do physically that I wasn't, I wasn't actually producing music with my body. And that, that was, I kind of reached a point where I'm like, I've sung before, I've played guitar before, like I told you a little bit in bands in high school and stuff. And so I picked it up again and I just started, you know, learning some covers and starting to write my own songs through that. And uh, went to my first open mic. Uh, and I think that was like 2000, yeah, it was probably 2005 and probably had my first show the subsequent year. So yeah, it, and it was, the type of thing where I was burnt out. I mean, New, it's going to be competitive no matter what you do in the arts, right? But New York, I believe, at least at that time, the industry, most of it was happening on the West Coast. And so in New York, there's still productions happening, but there's a much smaller pool of jobs. Uh, and so it may have turned out differently if I started out, you know, in Los Angeles. Uh, but I'm very actually happy uh, that I've taken this direction with everything. Yeah, well, and like California or Los Angeles is also very focused on films in Hollywood. And so that probably would have opened up all new doors for film right. scoring. But I feel like there's plenty of opportunity in New York for live performances and small music clubs around the city and things like that. And so it's it's really, you know, too different cities as similar and they are as Absolutely. like there are people pursuing music it can be different in what you're looking for and so yeah um, i mean and, and also just the culture is different there and you know when I, yeah. whenever i speak to people who go back and forth a lot uh it's just it's such a different vibe uh but the thing i lo always loved about new york is the energy uh there, there's just this vortex you're kind of pulled into it and for better or for worse, because sometimes it can be overwhelming, but uh, it's definitely been a motivating force in my writing, just to have all these great artists around me, the community of filmmakers, art, you know, all these different multiple uh, people who do multiple types of art um, just surround me. And and so it's very exciting to, to be around that all the time. Yeah, I'm sure. And so you started wanting to from pre-med going into music, what yep. tips or advice would you give to other people not like ready to take that leap and who want to start pursuing music? Yes, yeah, it's, it's really a hard thing to, to give advice on because it really depends on what a person is looking for, what their true north is, so to speak. Um, and I think I would ask them, like, what do you ultimately want to get out of uh, at the end of the day? What do you consider success? And that does change as you get older, but I think it's a good place to start because if you want to be famous, it's a very different approach than wanting to just create things that people will enjoy or 
And there's a, and there's a whole spectrum of, of six, what we consider success to be. And so I think for somebody who's like coming of age and I would say, just keep pushing forward. And the more skills you learn, the better off you are. Like learn more instruments, learn how to record, learn how to take photography. I mean, just pursue all these things and get some business courses down, like learn economics, like basic accounting. Like it's crazy how for me, that was the biggest hurdle because I was trying to run my own business as, as a freelance uh, film composer. And yeah. I don't believe I got the most out of it because I didn't have the business acumen or, or the skill set to be a business person. Um, so I would also give that advice. Like if you're deciding, even if you want to do it part-time, even if it's, you know, just something you want to promote on the side, think business-like, think about how to market yourself. Even if it's a sty it, it can be stymieing to us creativity in, in a creative way, but you almost have to see yourself from the outside as a product. Um, if you're producing things that, people you want people to consume so i think i was a lot more idealistic when i was in college age i'm, I'm much more pragmatic and kind of <laughs> grounded these days uh, well yeah but... and it's a it's a big thing of i feel like looking at music from the outside it's like oh this artist you know came out with this album and is now going on tour and then being more in the industry you look at the you know, long list of like writers who helped them out on the album, all the producers they worked with, the people who are like helping them book these shows on tour. And it's so many more people than what it Absolutely. normally seems like is involved, even just on the business side from like managers, accountants, things like that. And and I discovered I, that with film music too, that, uh, you know, Hans Zimmer, he, you know, very yeah. famous composer, but he has a team of orchestrators and other composers he works with and he's he's sort of the the company so to speak like he's the brand name uh and not to say he doesn't do writing but he's got a team of folks like working with him to produce a score they could produce a score like in three weeks you know full feature film but yeah. he can't do that on his own that's for sure hey if you're like me and you're interested in the youtube or creator space you should check out the published press the Published Press is a completely free newsletter founded by YouTubers Colin and Samir. They host their own podcast talking to some of YouTube's largest creators. They've edited some of the best content I've seen on YouTube, and now they're sharing their knowledge about the YouTube space with you for free. The Published Press comes out three times a week every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with everything going on with your favorite creators and platforms. And like I said, it's completely free. Just enter your email address to receive the Published Press whenever it comes out, and that's it. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below, sign up to the Published Press, and get all the info you need on the industry. I want to go back to, you You mentioned, like, each person's definition of success or what they want out of music. For you, what does success look like for you, or what's your goal with your career? I think um, it's changed a bit over the years, uh, but there's a few aspects that have stayed true and I think I always wanted to find a connection to an audience I I felt compelled to create these things whether they were songs whether they were instrumentals and it always was a there was a desire for me to connect to people through that and to give humanity that um and there's something magical like that you can create something uh, you know in your bedroom and the whole world can enjoy it. I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. And, and I love the digital aspect. I think it took me a little while to get over the hump of really delving into it. But I love both the fact that you can reach anyone around the world, but then you can go outside and go to a venue and meet a bunch of folks who are, you know, part of the scene. Uh, and, I, and I think I've, I've learned how to enjoy that from working with different genres, like working in jazz, it's much more hands-on, uh, kind of old school in that way. Where, whereas like dance music or instrumental music, you know, a lot of it is just totally in the world of 
digitized world. Um, so it, it, it can, I enjoy the communal aspect of it and I enjoy finding an audience. And it's been a challenge to find an audience. Would I say I'm successful? Um, taking small steps toward finding it, but I think um, that's a journey in and of itself. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting. You, you mentioned like finding an audience, finding people who are interested in the music that you're putting out or the same stuff that you are. And a large way that artists are doing that nowadays is through, you know, social media, TikTok, YouTube, right. all these things. What, how do you feel about artists sort of trying to promote themselves or like make music uh, that can be shared through social media? Oh, I, I think it's great. I, I love how the platforms, I'm not a huge social media person. Uh, you know, I, I love the networking side of it and the creative side of it, but I kind of get addicted like a lot of people and I don't like how it, it kind of pulls me in like that. But that being said, um, I like how the platforms allow for you to sync any kind of music you want to your reel or to, you know, um, and these short form videos are pieces of art of their own. So I, I have a lot of respect. You know, my wife watches a lot of, a lot of the Instagram and TikTok reels and I, and I have a lot of respect for what those folks do on them. It's just incredible. Um, I, I think, though, I have to look at myself and say, one, and this is also something I would tell a, a younger version of myself, what do you like to do? And do that as much as possible. So I think you're going to be the happiest by doing the thing you love to do. And of course, us doing all this promotion and all the social media, there's stuff we don't want to do, obviously, but it leads us to do more of what we want to do. And so we're like, okay, I'm going to put some money down. Okay, I'm going to, you know, get some reviews. I'm going to, you know, work the social media angle because I want to get more opportunities. So it, it kind of is a feedback network. Uh, but ultimately, you have to have that thing that you just love to do. What is your passion, right? That's going to fuel everything else. Yeah, awesome. And for you, whether it's, you know, the instrumental music you've made, the original songs, film scoring, any kind of music that you create, and maybe it changes depending on the kind, but what does your creative process typically look like when you, you know, sit down and try to write? It's different uh, sometimes every time. Uh, I always, you know, a, a lot of songwriters can attest to this that they keep recordings of themselves like you know the voice memos on your phone I, I always if I have an idea whether it's a melody I just put everything down don't think think about it later you don't have to complete it now just get that down because if it's something that just catches your ear then it, it's going to be something worthwhile later on or even if it isn't it's just worth putting it down um, so that that's one part of my process, and that that's pretty continuous, no matter what I'm working on. Um, with instrumentals, I am very uh, inspired by visual, and maybe that's partially my schooling uh, that I went to school to write music to video. So oftentimes, I will take a scene from a movie and sync it to my my software and write melodies to it and create something in the structure actually that comes from, you know, the, the ebbs and flows of whatever's going on in the scene. Um, and, and more often than not, that was the main impetus for a, a lot of this music that I've written, especially for this uh, album that's about to come out. So the visual to me is, and that can, that, merging of the senses i have a fascination fascination with i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly but synesthesia where it's a it's a condition where folks their sense senses are mixed together uh, and oftentimes yeah. they be like see sound and hear what you know uh what they see with the visual and i think everyone has a little bit of that in them this sort of abstract 
way of perceiving the world. And so I always was like chasing after that. Yeah, there's uh, um a, a producer I really like Ryan met who he's the he's part of AJR and does most of like the production work that they do. And I think to some degree he has that because he'll talk about like the colors of certain sounds that he uses yeah. in their music. So he'll he'll be like listening back to one of their songs and be like, yeah, this song sounds orange to me or something like that. Yeah. And he, he talks about how like he uses that to help other aspects of their work. Like if he listens through and, you know, hears a bunch of the same color, maybe that's a color they use in like the cover art for that album, something like that. And so it's really right, cool right. that some people are just in in touch with their senses like that where they can connect it to other things or like experience it in a different way and right and i love that collaborative aspect that yeah he'll, he'll work with somebody uh and see their art from a different view vantage point uh because yeah. that helps the artist too it's like it really becomes like a conversation that you have with the person that you're creating it for um and uh, I, I love the give and take of that. Definitely. And so just going more towards your career in music, whether it's um, a score that you made for like, that, that you really think enhanced a scene that it was in or an original song of yours, is there something you made that you think performed better than you thought it would have originally? Well, I think a lot of this film music, some of it's a, a quite old, you know, from that earlier period. Some of it's a little newer. Um, and and just seeing how people react to that has been really uh, eye-opening. I, I am, They're talking about that visual aspect that I always talk about that. Um, and the fact that that connection is made in their mind tells me I'm doing, I'm on to something here. Uh, and so I'm really excited to just continue to put out this this music because it, it feels like it's resonating. Uh, it feels like playlist uh, curators are, you know, their their ears are peeking up and they're like, yeah, there's something here. Um, and I I'm very proud of my songwriting, but it's like a in many ways a different world and. I think ultimately, ultimately requires a whole different context um, that I didn't realize when I was first writing it, what, how it would affect people. Uh, but that I'm also excited to, to push forward. Uh, my, my wife and I have been working on a musical. It's mostly her, uh, but you know, she's taken a lot of my songwriting and kind of built a narrative around it. Uh, and it's just been, that was magic. It's been magical to see that come together. Uh, and that made me realize that songwriting oftentimes benefits from having a context, having a story behind it. Uh, because, yeah. you know, it, it's like when you learn about your favorite artist and what was going on in their life when they wrote a particular song, it gives it the context. Yeah, and having that context of what the artist was going through can help a listener like relate it to something similar in their life, maybe. And so, like, if you learn that an artist wrote a certain song because they were in the middle of like a relationship ending, you can tie that back to, oh, like, I remember going through the end of yeah. my last relationship. Like, these lyrics, you know, I can relate in a similar way and so like for one the music can relate back to a listener and speak for itself but then having the personal connection with an artist of like we have been through something similar as people is a whole nother level of it that's really cool yeah there's like an empathy i don't know what it is like i think great artists can capture that that feeling that all of us can you know a universal feeling uh and and i love that but we all bring our individuality to it too. So it's like, yeah, I've experienced it, but in my own way, and I had these feelings about it, whereas you might have a totally different take on it. 
So you listening to that song, you might be sad. It might make you sad or with me, it might make me feel relieved. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's so funny how uh, the art really needs to be experienced to be alive. Right? I, I always say this, uh, if the tree falls in the forest, you know, everyone's, you know, this is a pretty well-known um, saying that if the tree falls in the forest is, and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? And um, it, that really stuck with me because if no one's there to hear it, then it doesn't really exist. You know, yeah. if no one's experiencing it. Yeah, I think that's really, that's an interesting aspect of it that I hadn't thought of before. Like, because almost any kind of sound or music like is experienced by someone. Someone hears it. Um, especially with music like it, if you can grow a fan base you have listeners for it but it's interesting the the correlation between like if if no one has heard this like there's no proof of its existence and and obviously it may have existed but there's no account in any form of like a witness a recording and there's no proof of its existence you just have to like rely on the laws of physics i guess or the universe to like know that it must have happened i guess the universe is the first you know if you believe in a higher power like you know that you're the mystical aspects of it that that may be the first i mean i i have a belief that as artists we're conduits and we're, we're taking things that maybe we don't fully understand that may not even be in us. We might be like channeling something uh, to create it. Um, and so in the least, you have that connection to that mystical aspect, uh, that other dimension, but it doesn't exist in this dimension yet until you actually play it out loud. Yeah, that's really cool. And so um, like listening to some of your, your stuff, like just the transit like hearing the film scoring that you've done and then the instrumental music that stands on its own um i wonder i just want to get your thoughts on if you have any on artists like tame impala who sort of blend like songwriting and i wouldn't really say pop music but like traditional Re released music by an artist and instrumental or immersive soundscapes like what are your thoughts if you have any on that I mean, I, I've music? always been a fan of David Bowie and he's probably you know uh, one of the first artists I've discovered that does precisely that uh, mm -hmm. and, and he had teamed up with Brian Eno to create the Berlin Trilogy trilogy uh and that really uh expanded my mind to hear that uh because they were taking all these found sounds sounds from keyboards you know and creating something totally new with it and something abstract like he's a songwriter but he's creating this abstract art that you can't exactly say what it's about it's up to you uh and I like how a song could be direct, but then the same artist gives you instrumental, an instrumental part, and your experience of it could be totally different uh, yeah. than what um, they've maybe even intended. Oh, what's another, I, you know, I, I always loved Radiohead and the, the work that they did in orchestrating their music uh, and creating a sense of dread or a sense of air space They're like i love artists that play with soundscapes i definitely do i'm definitely like partial to that yeah i i guess like and e even if it's not expansive soundscapes just artists who make ra rather than just a song that you listen to make music that like sort of brings you somewhere puts you in like an imaginary scene like i yeah grew up in a big like Beatles family listening to a lot of that and like especially now that I have an interest in music production the 
amount and quality of like sampling and using all these like random sounds that they thought of in their music way back then when like before it was as popular as it is now is really cool to me and it's like all, all these sounds sort of come together to like create ambience of like maybe I'm sitting somewhere listening to this song but like it's almost like I'm hearing people around me or like a or like I'm in whatever room they're trying to bring me to and, I, I, uh, I love that and in also like in going to school and learning about music history and especially music of the 20th century um there are composers back in the 40s and 50s who are starting to play around with that uh, let's see Milton Babbitt, uh, they're they're not like super well known folks. Edgar Varese, and they they were the ones actually to use the first samplers and the first synthesizers uh, back when in its infancy. Uh, and it, there there's even a the first one of the first sequencers called the Bukla was built in the fifties, and it has like patch cables that you connect oscillators. Yeah to one another additive synthesis to create a sound. Um, and you can create these sounds on a sequencer and play the sequencer back. Uh, so it has that memory to it. And Edgar Varese would take found sounds that, you know, uh, dropping a bowling ball on the ground, or he would take sounds and he'd create tape collages out of them. And so what's funny about the Beatles is that they came out of you know the rock and roll era that pop yeah. music you know they, they that's what they played early on and they discovered probably through george martin because george martin was classically trained discovered all this modern classical music and we're delving into you know uh, the term they there's a term called musique concrète which is the idea of bringing found sounds into a musical composition. And so they were doing it early, Pink Floyd was doing it, uh, but it was like emerging. That that time period is really cool because it was emerging of that, um, the experimental classical people. And, you know, it, it created this whole new thing. And the Beatles are, it's just, I, Listening to an album like Revolver, where it's yeah. just like, like something changed. You know, you hear a little bit of it in Rubber, Rubber Soul, but Revolver is like really when it happens. And there's just, they're not writing songs about girls as much or anymore. They're writing about bigger things, uh, more abstract things. The, the sounds are more abstract, sped yeah. up, slowed Definitely. down. Um, they, and they became a, a band that would create the sounds in the studio versus live. So I, I, I find that so fascinating that those two worlds mix together. And I think that's why people are still captivated by them, by that growth that they experienced in their pretty short artistic life together. Yeah. And with this whole conversation of like um, soundscapes or immersive music, I want to talk about your upcoming album that's an instrumental album, One Ambient Corridors. What can you tell us about the album, your process that went into it, anything like that? Well, I, over the years, I've created a lot of music, some for film projects, some for uh, what, what I would call wild cues, where they were built for a film that was being created but never used but it was like kind of inspired by it um pieces i just would write you know for fun so it was just i amassed all this music on my hard drive uh and i took a look at it and like this could be experienced like i was listening to it a little bit of it, like i can create my own playlist of this that can be experienced that I think people will get something out of. And I was playing around with that and I realized, wow, I can really create a world with this music, especially the stuff that was written around the same time. Um, and so that, that was like the genesis of it. And then for some of the older stuff, I had to like 
it, I don't know if you ever heard of the term digital rot, but that it, it's, it means like if you have something saved on a computer that's 20, 30, 40 years old, it's going to get harder and harder to bring that up to, you know, to, to actually yeah. recover that da data effectively. So a couple of the tunes that were from 20 years ago, uh, I had to like, export import export import and kind of reconstruct them and uh through through that experience i wrote even more from it like it may have been a, a minute and a half film cue and i wrote more to make it two and a half minutes so it's more complete uh so there's pieces of me from 20 years ago and pieces of me from last year um and and i love that side of it too it's like i almost feel like i'm a different person than i was 20 years ago so it's like two people are writing it um, so that was a really fun experience, even though it was difficult, uh, to yeah. really pull that all together. Uh, but, well, uh, and so what was the, like you mentioned, expanding on cues that you had from decades before, what was that like for you? And do you think you can hear the time difference when like listening back to the song? I don't think I can. Like, I think it's a thread that goes through everything I do. Mm -hmm. um, but there was the fire of being a young composer. It, you know, I was very prolific and working on a lot of different projects. And I didn't think they were very good at the time. <laughs> I didn't have the confidence uh, as I do now. And I look back at it and I'm like, man, that was pretty damn good. Like, I, I got to put this out into the world. Um, like, it's a shame that it's been sitting on my hard drive. Like, let me like bring yeah. the production up and and there's something here. Uh, so I think that the big difference between me back then is back then I was um, much more dismissive of myself. And uh, if someone said something bad about something, I was really hurt by it. Was, it had very thin skin. Uh, so to come at it with a more wise viewpoint um, is gratifying. Uh, in a way, it's like they're, they're like children, these pieces. Yeah. And I'm putting them through college. <laughs> and they're well, getting jobs. And there's like a sense that they're, they're, alive, they're beings that are alive. And I'm, I'm not locking them in the basement anymore. I'm actually letting them like pursue their life out in the yeah. world. <laughs> and that's that's really interesting because like um at least for me, like I have dabbled in music production or like started in a few years ago. Um and it's it's very interesting that when I first started, it was very much something that I like wanted to get better at before telling people like. I would tell close friends about it, but like right. whenever anyone outside of that circle would like ask to hear it, I was like, oh no, I, I, I don't want to show it. or like be almost embarrassed or ashamed of it. And now I've grown to a point where people will like ask me about it or want to talk to me. And I'm like, yeah, I do make the music. I do like, you know, want to produce and things like that. And I'm open to it just because I feel more confident in my abilities. And I'm like, yeah, I now have enough know-how and enough experience to be able to show you something that I'm proud of rather than something that's like me learning the basics. But even back then when you were learning the basics, I mean, you might look back at one of those earlier things and say, you know, that was pretty good, but I was yeah. just really, you know, green behind the ears or whatever. And, and I dismissed something that was actually pretty good. Um, and that's what I realized is like, in the moment of creating something, we're, we're vulnerable. Uh, and it's, even if you have a lot of confidence, you have to get back to that vulnerable place uh, to tap into it. And you just have to believe that it's worthwhile. You know, just believe in the process. Let it come to its end without, yeah, um, without censoring it. Uh, I'm I'm taking a lot of terms from the artist way. There's a there's a book that I studied years ago, 
uh, with, with the film composer that I apprenticed. And that was life changing. I think that got me on the road of really putting both feet in the water, so to speak, and really doing it for real. Uh, so I recommend that book to anybody. It's it, the author is, was a former um, alcoholic, so she, recovering alcoholic, and she created film uh, scripts. So she sort of had to teach herself how to write sober and came up with this 12 step program of, for artists. Uh, and so you sort of, when you deconstruct it, you realize like our culture does more to take things apart than put them together. I think we're more analytical in our culture. And I think it, it says, you know what? It's more meaningful to put something together. You know, it's actually magical to do that, even if somebody doesn't support you on it, or even though the world doesn't seem to be interested, it's actually magic. And you're tapping into something very deep within yourself, within the universe. And um, it's it's part of the joy of being alive. So do it in any way you can. It doesn't just have to be music, right? It could be any sort of creative endeavor. Uh, so that that's always stuck with me. Yeah, and I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind and probably a great note to start wrapping things up with. But So thank you, Jason, for coming on and telling us about your career, your music, and on top of okay. the artist way, if there's anything of yours that you want to shout out or promote, feel free to do it now. Well, the album's uh, going to be out uh, January 23rd. So it's actually the 15th anniversary of my first release. So it's it's a very meaningful date to me. And I'm just really exciting to sh excited to share it with the world. And uh, I, I just really appreciate, you know, uh, you just talking with me about art. I think it's, it's something that's a lot of fun to talk about. And... Uh, I revel the, the opportunity. So thanks again. Yeah. Thank you for coming up.